Pada Ramadan tahun ini, masyarakat di seluruh dunia, termasuk warga Amerika dan Indonesia, sedang bekerja, belajar dan beribadah dari rumah. Meskipun kita berjauhan secara fizik, semangat kita tetap bersama dalam menjadikan bulan suci Ramadan sebagai momen untuk refleksi diri dan peduli dengan sesama. Saya Heather Variava, kuasa usaha at Interim Kedubes AS, mengucapkan selamat menunaikan ibadah puasa. Hi everyone, welcome back to Ad America TV. Welcome back. Hi, I'm Fifi. We welcome all of our audience members joining us online. We hope that you are doing well and, of course, staying safe. So for those of you who never know what Ad America is, Ad America is the U.S. Embassy American Center here in Jakarta. And our mission is to provide a space for young Indonesians to learn more about the United States. We have generally moved a solid digital platform so you can enjoy us from the comfort of your own home. So for those of you guys who are joining with us right now via Ad America website, Twitter, Facebook and Periscope Live, you can simply leave your questions at the comment box for each platform. And in this episode, we will discuss about adapting your business to COVID-19, Indonesian and international outlook for established enterprises. And before we begin, let's break the ice with a little cap. So the questions for tonight's event is, due to COVID-19, small business owners in the U.S. are eligible to apply for an economic disaster injury loan that worth up to how much? A. $20,000 B. $30,000 C. $15,000 and D. $10,000 You guys can answer the questions by commenting at our live on Facebook at America. Stay tuned until the end of the program. forget to take a selfie and tag at America's Instagram account during the event. And before we begin our tonight's event, there will be an opening remarks from Evan Flower, Econ Section, US Embassy, Jakarta. Hi, Evan. Hello. Hey, hey, All right. Sorry. I kept being put on mute. All right. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Salamat Malam dan Salamat Berpuasa untuk semuanya. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to speak to everyone remotely uh, and uh, always a, a great pleasure for the U.S. Embassy to support uh, events uh, and dialogues and conversations that are taking place uh, at America. Um, whether that's uh, in person uh, at, at our at America space uh, in Pacific Place Mall, um, or uh, given the uh, large scale social distancing uh, conversations that are now taking place um, uh, online. So uh, again, my name is Evan Fowler and I'm an economic officer at the US Embassy in Jakarta. Uh, and what our role is, is to uh, try and better understand uh, some of the changes that are taking place here in Indonesia uh, in the economic sphere uh, and to try and uh, communicate those to uh, our colleagues based in Washington uh, so that we can um, uh, promote policies that uh, support uh, Indonesian workers, uh, that support U.S. companies uh, that are here and active uh, and supporting Indonesia's development. 
uh, and to uh, try and kind of improve the efficiency of our, of our um, policy making. So uh, with that said, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here to help kick off this uh, event uh, on adapting your business to, to COVID-19 um, and, and provide a, a little bit of kind of uh, an opening remark on, on this question of the outlook for both Indonesian uh, and international businesses. Um, I think what I have done uh, so far in uh, our own quarantine, which, which may be difficult to understand, uh, is to try and read things um, about uh, pandemics in the past um, or to read uh, stories um, about uh, pandemics or about plagues, uh, which is not, not very light reading uh, amid a, a pandemic that we're all living through. Um, but, but one of the most famous uh, is a book by uh, the French Algerian writer uh, Albert Camus that was published in 1947 um, that talks about uh, a plague that was sweeping the Algerian city of Oran. Uh, and one of the quotes that I thought was most interesting was, uh, what we learn in time of pestilence, that there are more things to admire in men uh, than to despise. Uh, and what I think is most telling about that is, is that, um, at least based on kind of my uh, understanding, you could replace uh, men in that quotes with uh, maybe businesses or, or companies um, and, and be able to uh, admire uh, some of the things that have um, that these companies have already been doing um, in, in response to the, to the virus, both, um, as I said, Indonesian companies uh, and uh, U.S. companies that are active in the country. Um, so, for example, you know, we look at um, Universitas Indonesia uh, that has already developed an ultraviolet-based disinfectant booth. Uh, for medical equipment. Uh, we look at the Surabaya Institute of Technology uh, that has been working with hospitals to develop a disinfectant chamber um, that you know, uses ozone rather than uh, chemical disinfectants. Um, we look at uh, state-owned enterprises like um, PT Pindad and PT Len Industry uh, that are now um, you know, manufacturing ventilators using schematics from um, Universitas Indonesia or Universitas Gajah Mada um, or other um, research and technology um, uh, centers. Um, and, and in addition, you know, um, we, we continue to see U.S. companies um, that are stepping up. Um, so, you know, companies like Procter & Gamble um, that has, you know, given 1.5 billion uh, rupiah uh, worth of PPEs um, to frontline workers here in Indonesia. Um, yeah, to other companies like IBM um, that has, you know, given a cloud-based um, application uh, to the uh, to Indonesia's COVID-19 response task force. Um, so, you know, as I said, you know, we continue to see companies um, uh, stepping up to the the plate, and um, you know, that's um, supplemented by a uh, Indonesian population. Um, you know, that has continually been recognized uh, throughout the world for high levels of volunteering, um, you know, frequency for donating. Uh, one only needs to look at uh, kitabisa.com to see the amount of crowdfunding campaigns uh, to support informal sector workers, street vendors, um, delivery drivers, um, and, uh, you know, young Indonesians that are trying to raise money uh, to purchase uh, additional personal protective equipment um, for, for healthcare workers. Um, so uh, I think, you know, what we have seen is that even amidst a, a lot of the uh, gloom and despair and the difficulties coping with this crisis, it is a lot of really positive efforts, um, you know, from, from companies around the world. Um, that being said, um, you know, what we have also seen is that COVID-19 is a, is a great equalizer. Right? It affects entire industries, small and medium-sized enterprises, uh, and large companies both. Um, and most interestingly, it forces companies and economies to adapt and evolve. Right? So um, we hear a lot about how the, the virus, you know, once it has passed, um, you know, will expedite the use of technology uh, that can improve customers' and employers' lives. Um, it can encourage companies to kind of come up with better crisis response and business continuity plans. Um, it can encourage uh, cybersecurity protocols to be in place. 
um, and uh, it can help create an environment to allow for um, remote workforce planning. Um, so for people with um, you know, children or people that want to work from home, uh, it can hopefully um, push that forward. Um, and it can kind of encourage new sectors to emerge, right? Um, we look at uh, the improved virtual education offerings um, and, and digital healthcare, um, and, and both of these have the opportunity to reach more, um, you know, students or reach more patients, um, provide more flexibility and agility, um, and, and so a lot of those are really positive developments. Um, that being said, you know, there are continuing things that we worry about on top of the immense uh, human cost that the virus has already uh, taken uh, in the United States, in Indonesia, and around the world. Um, some industries that, you know, we had relied on for years, right, commercial airlines, grocery stores, um, hotels, a lot of those have been changed overnight. Uh, and there's increasing questions about um, deglobalization of supply chains, uh, concerns about venture capital um, and, and kind of where investment will flow uh, given the significant amount of risk, um, changes in transportation, questions about data monitoring and surveillance um, given the amount of contact tracing that's taken place in some, some countries um, and kind of what this means for um, the future of work um, and, and whether businesses are going to be um, more flexible um, or less flexible in, in terms of the uh, cost placed on workers. Um, so there's a significant amount of questions, um, but as I said, I, I think, you know, even amidst the, the doom, I think there's a, a level of optimism given um, what we've seen the private sector do and, and step up um, and, and, and be, you know, uh, ready to, to fill in um, some of the gaps that uh, exist naturally um, uh, with, with governments responding to a, a crisis on this scale. Um, so with that, you know, I, you know, just like to say that, um, you know, it, it will be a very useful discussion and, and I'm happy that we were able to, to bring uh, experts to this stage uh, to be able to kind of talk through some of these issues um, and, and maybe, um, you know, provide some uh, insight into questions that are swirling around your head as, as you're, you know, sitting at home trying not to eat more and more uh, Jajanan Pasar. Um, so uh, with that, I'm happy to, to turn it over and uh, thank you very much. All right, thank you everyone for, uh, for the warm welcome. Okay, let's just start the event. I'd like to invite our uh, moderator for tonight. So we're already connected to Mbak Alia. Hello Mbak Alia. Okay. Hello. Hi. Hi. How are you? Hope you're doing well and staying safe, of course. I I hope as well. All right. <laughs> well, uh, thank you for uh, the introduction. Hi, everyone. My name is Alia Marsha. I'm the managing editor of Campaign.com, and I am so excited to be moderating this talk. We have two brilliant speakers today, uh, or tonight, depending on where you're joining from. Uh, who will give us insights about how business can adapt to survive or even thrive in this um, in, in today's challenges. But before I introduce them, I just want to remind everyone to please don't hesitate to um, ask questions uh, on whichever platform you're watching from, because the Ad, uh, Ad America social media team will be compiling all your questions and we'll try to answer as many of them as possible. And also, you have a chance to win social media ad credits um, for your social enterprise. And this is for two winners. Um, and all you have to do is share your learning points from tonight's discussion on your Instagram story. Don't forget to be creative. Uh, mention at Ad America and at campaign underscore ID. And the winners will be announced tomorrow, Wednesday. Uh, May 6th on um, the Campaign for Change app, as well as our social media accounts. All right. So I want to speak, uh, I want to introduce the, the speakers briefly before we, you know, hear from them directly. But today um, we have Jeffrey Joe um, from Alpha JWC Ventures. Um, Jeff 
is a technology investor and the co-founder of Alpha GWC Ventures based in Indonesia and Singapore, but Jeff is joining us from Singapore tonight. Um, and uh, for uh, Indonesians who are joining this discussion, if you know Kopi Kenangan or Style Theory or Lemonilo, like Jeff is one of the guys behind that. So uh, welcome Jeff. Um, and also we have Michael Goldberg. Michael is a venture capitalist and a professor at the School of Management at uh, Case Western Reserve University in Ohio. So he's joining us all the way from Cleveland, Ohio. Um, thank you so much. Um, Michael has a massive online, massive open online course or MOOC. It's a mouthful um, called Beyond Silicon Valley. And this is really impressive. It's attracted over 175,000 students from uh, 190 countries um, on Coursera. So um, I'm very excited to hear from them. Um, and uh, yeah, and if you guys can talk a little bit uh, about um, introduce yourselves, uh, maybe we can start with Jeff. Um, my question for you both is, um, can you speak more about what you do and how COVID-19 has affected what you do? Maybe Jeff can start. Yeah, so thanks a lot, Alia. Um, hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And hopefully I can share a couple of things that are useful for everyone in this difficult situation. Yeah. So uh, um, we are Alpha GWC is a venture capital fund. Uh, it's a, we are early stage investor. We are we invest from seed until series B, typically. Um, um, ticket size anywhere from few hundred thousand US dollars to say 10 million or so. And uh, we are Indonesia Focus Fund, but we invest in regionally as well. So uh, we, uh, so far, we have managed about 200 million US dollars um, uh, fund under uh, management. And we invest actually not only in Indonesia. So two third of our investment is in Indonesian companies, but one third is Southeast Asian companies like Singapore and Vietnam. So we actually have um, quite a broader view of the technology startups um, in, the, in the region, not only in Indonesia, even though we have uh, 20 over people based in Indonesia. So we are actually very, very focused in Indonesia, but we also have that regional view. Um, to your, answer your question, Alia, uh, how is this COVID-19 affected our business? So um, this COVID-19 is actually um, a very, very um, unique um, event that is, I think, impacting everyone globally, right? Uh, I believe that is one of the biggest challenges that we had maybe since the previous big wars. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think this could actually um, um, give uh, a lot of setbacks for humanity in general, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, um, so in terms of investments, of course, what we see in the past, say, two to three months uh, in the region is that investments have slowed down significant, significantly. And that's uh, because of various reasons. One, one is that uh, we in the private sector, we always look into the uh, public sector or public market on how the asset value is uh, moving and uh, the stock market is very volatile. We also look into the healthcare sector on how is this healthcare really affecting not only the economy, but also uh, us um, as human being and how we behave. So a lot of uncertainties now. So unless we have a bit more certainties, I think um, we we expect that a lot of investments are actually slowing down significantly. Yeah, thanks for the answer, um, Michael. Do you want to go ahead? Sure. Uh, and let me start, and I probably won't say it correctly. Selamat puasa Ramadan. That was um, perfect. <laughs> there we go. Um, so hope everyone is having a, a good and happy fast. Um, so thank you for having me. Um, Join from uh, Cleveland, Ohio, and wearing my batik that I bought in Jakarta. Got to don't have a lot of good times to celebrate my batik, so I'm happy to do it. Um, thanks, Aaliyah, for your question about kind of the impact of, of COVID-19. I'll, I'll focus on it a little bit from kind of a more university perspective and what I'm seeing with students and startups here. Um, just on this on the student side, obviously. Um, my own university, as well as basically every university and school around the world, had to quickly remove to remote delivery of classes. So um, probably like everybody on this call, there's a lot of Zoom um, 
time where we're sort of sitting and delivering. I do actually think that kind of in terms of innovation for remote learning and remote work, this is going to be, I think in every crisis, there's going to be some good that comes out of these things. So um, I do believe that, that um, a lot of the, the things that we're doing um, remotely um, will last, including in education. Um, it's a really difficult time for students right now all over the world that are looking for both internships and full-time employment. Actually, I was just posting something on my social media looking for projects for um, in, the, in the U.S. during our summer. It's tr very traditional that um, students get internships and work at companies. And um, we're finding that many of our students are losing those opportunities. So we're sort of looking for how in this time and I, you know i think sessions like these are a good example like you know people are looking to to get more information um to work so what kind of projects can students do um so we're finding a little bit of funding to do that um Aliyah mentioned i and i'll talk about it a little bit in a second i do have a, a course on coursera that i developed we're finding a number of people are using this time when we're all stuck at home to get more skills. And there's a number of different resources that are out there. Um, and just to echo Jeffrey's point on kind of um, access to capital, um, um, Jeffrey's coming at it from an investor point of view for us working with a lot of our students and people in our community, professors that have startups, it is a very difficult time to raise capital. It's a difficult time to survive. There are some industries where startups um, you know, there's still activity, um, funds that still have capital under management um, are typically investing to support current portfolio companies. It's hard to attract for those entrepreneurs that are looking for new money. It's hard to attract money. So, I mean, I agree with a lot of the points that Jeffrey made. This is a really historic, challenging time. A number of us have lived through other crises, but this one feels very different and it's so global and um, I don't think any of us know how much longer this is going to last until we can kind of get back to business as usual, but it is, it is a challenge. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. I think um, because it is so, so new and so feels so large, I think this is, I think one of the reasons why we should be learning from one another at this time. And I also know that you have a presentation, a little presentation for us, Michael. Sure. Um, um, I will. Go ahead and share my screen with your permission. Um, so uh, let's see. There we go. Um, so in 2012, um, I had an opportunity to um, participate in the Fulbright program. So um, just a quick shout out to um, Fulbright. This is a State Department, um, U.S. Department of State from the US program that allows for US based professors and students to, um, to teach or research or study overseas. And, and that same opportunity, once we get back to normal, um, as I know Fulbright programs have been delayed because of the crisis, um, allows Indonesian students and professors to come to the US. So it's a great, um, great program run by um, many of the folks that are involved in this call at, at, and within the public affairs sections and state department. So I did a Fulbright in Vietnam. Um, those are my kids. The girls are now driving. So that was a few years ago, it was 2012. And I was um, asked to, a lot of Fulbrights, typically you're based at a university. I was teaching at a, um, at a business school in, in Hanoi and I was asked by the Ministry of Science and Technology. They have a national agency for technology, entrepreneurship and commercialization to um, do a course about how and um, Vietnam could become more like Silicon Valley. And, you know, I often ask kind of when I'm giving this presentation, like, why does everybody want to be like Silicon Valley? And, you know, the answers are, um, and for those, um, who are either, um, who are watching this call, who have been to the Bay Area, to San Francisco, we've got these amazing um, iconic companies, the Googles, the Facebooks, or the Apples of the world. Um, a lot of our talent, these three people in the middle are all graduates. They're all from, my city is Cleveland, Ohio. Many of our talented people, these are all graduates of our university. They go out to San Francisco to, to start new companies or work. The bottom person worked at Google. 
And, you know, in, in Jeffrey's line of work and although, and it's awesome to hear about the work that he's doing, there are growth capital sources that are growing um, outside of Silicon Valley in places like Singapore and Indonesia, but there's still the majority of capital in the U.S. is in Silicon Valley. So that's what's so awesome about San Francisco and Silicon Valley. But what I told um, my friends in Hanoi is that I wanted to do a lecture on a different city. And um, I don't know if anyone watching has been to Aaliyah or Jeffrey. Have you been to my city of Cleveland, Ohio? No, I have not. <laughs> You're most welcome after the crisis. You come, come visit me. So many people don't really know about Cleveland. Um, of course, this guy left to go to Los Angeles. Of course, no one's playing basketball, but some people are like, oh, we know Cleveland because LeBron James was playing there. But Cleveland actually has a very interesting entrepreneurial history. So 100 years ago, um, we were one of the most important economies in the U.S. and the world. Um, this is our most famous entrepreneur, Alir Jeffrey. You want to guess who anybody? Do you know who this is? Mm. You didn't know this was a quizzing game. I can't help myself. You know, Markham. This is yeah. John Rockefeller. It's our most famous entrepreneur from Cleveland, John D. Rockefeller. So then um, Cleveland fell on hard times. You know, we're sort of this art area is known as the Rust Belt. We're in, we're in between Detroit and Pittsburgh. So a lot of our traditional industries moved away and our population moved away. We were the fifth largest city in the United States. We became 47th largest actually in 2012. And it's even, um, even I think it's more like 52 now. Um, and interestingly, on the entrepreneurial side, Entrepreneur Magazine in 2001 did a survey of how well our communities, 61 communities in the U.S. supported entrepreneurship. And we didn't do very well. So what happened in Cleveland was, um, you know, in Silicon Valley, like we mentioned, it's an amazing ecosystem. It's, it's really at this point sort of fully um, developed and, and privately, um, you know, venture capitalist angel investors are investing for return on investment orientation in a place like Cleveland. And, and this is true in other parts of the world, which we'll talk about. It's really this partnership between private sector government and donors that are supporting the ecosystem. Um, so back to Vietnam, I ended up doing like a Skype actually back then it was Skype. No one uses Skype anymore for Microsoft. Um, and I was doing sessions. This is a friend of mine who ran the state of Ohio um, program to support entrepreneurship. And then um, I know both in Indonesia and in Vietnam, after a successful event, everybody loves to take a photograph. So we took a nice photograph. And then um, I actually didn't think that I, I'd never really taught kind of a course about ecosystem building. But when I got back to the US, I, one of my colleagues, we had just, <clears throat> excuse me, joined Coursera's platform. And then um, one of my colleagues said, would you consider turning this seminar into a MOOC? And I didn't even know what that was. And as Leah mentioned, it's a massive open online course. Um, what we did is we, I interviewed a lot of folks from our ecosystem, including some people from around the world to kind of share our experience in Cleveland, and we can talk about it a bit today, um, with folks in the world. And we, we've had quite a few people. We had 175,000 people take the class from 190 countries. We have subtitles in um, 16 languages, including Indonesian, because the U.S. Embassy in Indonesia was nice enough to translate the subtitles. Um, in 2016, I did have a chance to come out um, on a program in person um, for two weeks to Indonesia. So this is um, when I was in, I went to um, Jakarta, uh, Medan, and this was in Sumatra. So there's me with a different batik shirt and some of the participants in a workshop in Sumatra on, on a class on social entrepreneurship. I brought my son. He was very popular um, with all the students. So here's our, well, let's see if this works. Um, I love Indonesia. I think he he led. Um, no one really wanted to take a photograph with me, mostly just with him. 
So anyway, I had, I had a chance um, to begin some really great conversations in Indonesia. And again, it's been four years, but this, um, you know, uh, ecosystem where government is playing a role, donors and whether those donors be philanthropy or um, the U.S. government or other sort of foreign donors through things like USAID um, and then the private sector. And, and actually, it's interesting. I'm excited to learn more from Jeffrey. I know even since 2016, access to venture capital with funds like the work that Jeffrey's doing has really increased. So, um, yeah, I look forward to chatting more. Yeah, no, uh, it's a good thing that you mentioned how different, you know, different, I think, connecting it back to COVID-19, I think different regions, like we know that it's, this is affecting people globally, but I think different countries are experiencing things very differently. And, and like, like industries, even you can't really say that everyone's um, dealing with the same kind of challenges. Um, so I'm, in re I'm really interested in what you both think of how different, um, I guess, how different countries like response to this is affecting that country's like um, economy. Like I know, uh, Jeff, you have, uh, you've, you've invested in companies in, uh, in Jakarta, in Vietnam, Southeast Asia. Like, do you see a difference? Do you see similarities? And uh, same goes for you, Michael, like in the U.S., like, do you see what do you how what do you notice i think um i guess is what i'm trying to ask um michael do you want to go first sure um yeah i mean i've, I've had a chance actually to do a couple of these um remote sessions with a couple of other embassies i did something with hanoi actually later this week i'm doing cambodia and colombia so um you know government are reacting differently. And, and when we think about governments, I think it's important to think about the different, um, you know, whether it's a federal government response, a, a regional government response. So in the US, this is, these are states, we have 50 states, and then local government responses to the crisis. Because um, you're seeing different types of responses. And, and frankly, because of the speed at which the crisis came upon us, and the massive unemployment that has taken place, um, I think the responses are differing. The responses are experimental. Um, and I think we're finding, at least in the U.S. context, that the, that the initial responses aren't deep enough. So, um, you know, it really is a challenging time. I think, you know, both Jeffrey and I, because of the work that we do, focus on um, more high growth entrepreneurship companies that can sort of scale. I mean, the reality of entrepreneurship, I think as we all know, whether it's Indonesia, Cleveland, anywhere, I mean, many entrepreneurs are not working in technology um, oriented, high growth companies that need the kind of venture capital that Jeffrey's firm provides. So that's a whole nother segment if you're running a restaurant or selling at a market um, so there's different kinds of responses for different types of entrepreneurs. And, um, you know, I think there's just a lot of experimentation and there's a lot of pain that's happening um, because it's, it's not, um, it really can't be deep enough. I think this question about how do you support entrepreneurs and you're starting to sort of see, even in the U S like um, there's some, there's some pushback, you know, um, entrepreneurs that that have funding but are sort of looking for government funding, you know, should they be getting it? So there's all sorts of not surprisingly controversy about who's receiving what kind of government aid. But um, there's just a lot of experimentation happening around the world right now. Mm -hmm. Interesting. What about you, Jeff? Like, what do you see? Do you see any difference from, like, say, companies here uh, in Jakarta versus? Um, Maybe you live in, you're in Singapore right now, like how different is that? Um, also like companies in Vietnam. Yeah, so so first of all, uh, we see the, uh, a lot of different government responses, right? Mm -hmm. um, how I want to put it is that, okay, first of all, um, let's see how rich or poor the country is in terms of GDP per capita. Mm -hmm. And second is uh, how strict or flexible uh, the government is, right? 
So, for example, one of the stickers maybe in Asia is, okay, China is definitely very strict of total lockdown. India is also very, very strict, right? Singapore is actually not so, right? Singapore people are still allowed to go out, um, like maybe walk in the park uh, and then buy groceries and all that. So people can still move around, but of course not many um, uh, facilities open and uh, we cannot dine in uh, in restaurant. Same like Indonesia. Indonesia is also um, a bit more flexible and it's not total lockdown. Uh, mm-hmm. I really believe that uh, um, no matter where you are in the world, if let's say if it's a uh, poorer countries, with total lockdown, I think you will see a very, very bad impact, right? Mm-hmm. Richer countries, flexible, they're okay, right? So, and then uh, I say this with one caveat, right? No government in the whole world that actually prepared for this kind of pandemic. So so let's assume that everyone got caught it uh, off guard, mm-hmm. uh, be it, you know, government, be it businesses, even personal as well. Who would have thought that uh, we are stick? So last year, I, I counted that I, I traveled 52 times in a year. So Jakarta, Singapore, Jakarta counts like one trip, right? Mm-hmm. I had 52 trips. And now in the past two months, I'm, I'm, I'm not going anywhere, right? I'm stuck at home. So I, I would say that um, this is really ca- uh, caught everyone off guard. And uh, the severity of the impact of this is depends on how strict it is. And mm-hmm. uh, why, why it's important to understand uh, the importance of the how rich or poor a country is uh, based on GDP per capita. Because if let's say if a rich country, right, uh, rich countries with the high GDP per capita, not only the government can actually give a lot of subsidies, like Singapore uh, government is give, giving a lot of subsidies to the uh, to the companies, which is awesome, right? So the economic impact will not be too severe. Uh, first of all, Singapore has the highest, one of the highest GDP per capita uh, in Asia, at least. And uh, the government is also have a lot of, um, good balance sheet so they will be pretty much okay but still this is our effect but in the countries that uh, uh, poorer and then the government might not have a lot of levers to actually help to give the stimulus and all that um, mm-hmm. I'm afraid that the impact will be quite severe mm. what are you um, yeah that's interesting what from from your perspective like what are you most um, kind of like afraid of or what are you more, most concerned about with the situation maybe in different uh, in different countries or in general um, as an investor what are you, what is like the worst case scenario and but also but if you think there's no worst case scenario that what 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 can we like turn into like opportunities at this time yeah so so for me uh, I personally uh, wh- what I'm worried the most is uh, a very slow response and a very, very slow action. The reason why is because economy is, is like, you know, it's a wheel, right? So um, economies will get this, you know, um, um, really, really clearly. No matter where we, we go, it's better to have, a, you know, a quick, painful kind of, you know, um, measures rather than having a slow, uncertain recovery, right? Um, for example, I just want to point out, for example, Warren Buffett just had this uh, um, uh, the annual meeting, shareholder meeting uh, a few days ago, and he sold all of his airline, right, Air- airline stock. It shows that someone like Warren Buffett, which I respect a lot, um, he actually, you know, um, predicted, or at least based on what he, he, he did, he predicted that there's a, there's a change in the whole um, travel landscape that will really affect the airlines um, lo- uh, long term. And that's what I'm I'm afraid of, right? Because if let's say the recovery takes slower and we are we are dealing with an invisible problem or invisible enemy, I mean, we do not know who's attacking, attacking us, who got the virus, because this is the virus is actually not, not deadly, right? So there's a lot of other deadlier virus, like, you know, dengue um, and all that. That's even deadlier, right? So I'm afraid that, we the virus will live with us for quite some time and depending on how government react and how we as human being react that might actually slow down the economy for quite a while and that to restart the economy i think is going to be very 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 slow and that's the worst case that we will face because when the economy uh, will is you know uh, turning very very slowly mm-hmm. it's very hard to kick start the economy again mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, 
you know, like Michael, you, you previous, uh, before this, you talk about how, you know, people are experiment, like companies are experimenting. And like, from what Jeff has just said, it sounds like we're going to be experimenting for a long time. Um, and that's pretty, I mean, that's pretty, that's something, right. Um, but Michael, I'm curious about what you, what you feel like, um, companies like should do right now, like based on your experience, I know in Hanoi, you mentioned how, um, one experimentation that companies are doing right now is like laying off some of some of their um, talents, right? But then, in when uh, when you're talking to the USMC in Hanoi, you talk about how that's actually one of the things that you don't want to be doing too much because you know it'll be like Jeff said, like it'll be hard to pick pick up like the pace when this is all over, even though we know that it's maybe gonna take some time to be over. So, do you have like? maybe for people here, I think they're curious about like practical tips that they can apply. Do you have, you know, insights like that, Michael? Um, no, that's a great question, Leah. I mean, I think it's difficult to generalize. I mean, mm -hmm. it's it's easy to give advice to entrepreneurs to keep talent. It's hard to do that when you can't make payroll. So I think what's happening um, is just, you know, entrepreneurs, and founders and, and company, I mean, they're, I think folks are just doing what they can. I think it is sort of this, the fact, and it's not just in the U S but in many markets around the world, this was, you know, labor markets were actually pretty tight for talent. Um, and, you know, my sense is that many of the type of people that may be tuning into this kind of event in Indonesia are young tech savvy folks that, um, you know, are just like the kind of people that, the kind of portfolio companies that Jeff invests in need to grow. Um, and it just may be a while um, until places are hiring again. Um, I mean, I was just looking this morning, you know, I mentioned that on our own campus, we're funding our students, you know, many of them have the back, the kind of backgrounds, whether it's computer science, engineering, business, like they're the kind of, in pre COVID, they would have been hired you know, immediately there'd be a fight for that. And now, you know, things are slowing. So I guess more of my advice is less to come. It's very difficult to generalize across companies because, um, you know, I mean, there are some companies that are doing quite well at, at this moment because of the types of products or services that are offering, you know, others. I mean, if you're running a, 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 a bar or, um, a venue. I mean, it's, just, it's it really is becoming like very difficult to envision how we get back. I mean, it's sad. I mean, there's so many amazing, you know, events that we can do, you know, that, that involve cheering our sports teams on together or being at movies or being at the food court at, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, at the mall and all these things are so, I think it's going to take a while until there are, you know, proper testing and vaccines for some of these areas. But I mean, I think probably for the folks that are on this call, I think the question is what can you do as individuals to just keep um, your own skills and learning? I just, I mean, I see it with my own kids right now. It's like, I mean, you know, Netflix is, there's tons of Netflix subscriptions that are up, but like sitting around all day, we're all doing it like watching Netflix that doesn't really prepare you. No offense to my friends at Netflix doesn't really prepare you for kind of post crisis. Like, you, you know, what are you doing during this time to kind of prepare yourself? So when things come back and it will in certain areas, like you're ready to kind of, you know, you've gained new skills during the crisis to make you even more attractive to um, companies. Right. Like, what about you, Jeff? Like, what do you think um, can businesses do? Maybe businesses of like medium or large size, what can they do to survive right now? Is it, you know, uh, making the team smaller? Is it pivoting to different, you know, models or focuses? What, what do you think? Yep. So, uh, unfortunately, I don't have a uh, good news for uh, to share with everyone. Right. And actually, I, I agree with Michael, what Michael said. Um, so, um, Michael mentioned a couple of times about growth, right? And that's that's correct. Uh, we as venture capital, we uh, we really 
invest in the high growth companies. And for the longest time, uh, at least before this COVID um, happened, we only focus on growth because that's the only way to create a, a great successful companies like or Google, Facebook, or like uh, in your spine, Michael. But unfortunately now, first of all, there are three buckets of companies, right? One is the company that benefit from this, that will see decent growth, right? Uh, very, very few companies actually have a massive growth at this current um, moment. Maybe like Zoom, for example. Zoom is having a, a massive growth. Uh, Netflix have a decent growth. Some companies have good Amazon and then some gaming companies, right? But there are also second category whereby the companies is just okay, not really affected too much, okay? And then uh, third, which is I think 80% of the companies are fall into this bucket, which is getting negatively impacted. And some is maybe like from from the 80% of the total um, total companies is my personal guess. From the 80%, maybe 40, 50% is slightly negatively impacted, but 30% is can be um, quite heavily impacted because retail is actually a big part of economy. And uh, at least in, in Southeast Asia, not a lot of um, uh, retail and also offline um, outlets or, or businesses can actually adopt the delivery and online. So the majority of the companies are actually in not in a good shape, right? So um, the advice that I always give to my founders is that, okay, first of all, we need to think on how to survive this storm, right? So um, to be very specific, this is my, this is at least how I uh, approach the situation. Whatever happened in the next six months to 12 months, by the way, we in Indonesia, we are only at the second month, right? So President Jokowi just said that the first confirmed case in Indonesia, second of March, which is like a little bit more than two months uh, ago. So we are at the very early stage, right? So let's say this, this situation will last for another six to 12 months. So this is the six to 12 months period of our life gone. And to be honest, not many people will care to remember what will happen in the next six to 12 months. So as far as I'm concerned, some of my companies, right? They can, they can just do whatever they need to do to make sure that they can survive until this, this whole thing, hopefully getting better in the next six to 12 months. And uh, they can hibernate. Uh, they can um, you know, do whatever they need to do. But the most important thing is that when these things recover, they need, to, they need to think on how to actually go back to the growth uh, mode, right? It can be with the same business model, which is unlikely because the world will never be the same, I think, um, or, uh, so, or finding a new things, right? And then what are some of the companies or even individuals can do? Like what Michael said, pick up new, uh, uh, new skills, right? For example, um, actually for, uh, for uh, Indonesian that's actually watching this, uh, I think this is a good time to really take a step back and pick up some of the skills. I really hope that we can see more engineers in, in the... In I am looking at the question list and it looks like we have a few questions ready. So I'm going to try to... Um, I'm going to... Um, we're going to go there now. Okay. So um, the first question... Sure. Reference. In the U.S. is us. Oh, yeah, my, my mom or grandma used it. Um, and we acquired Time Warner. So, you know, I lived through this very painfully and, you know, a number of us have lived through 08. And, you know, I think we know because history has taught us that there's gonna be out of this kind of wreckage of a crisis, there's gonna be new opportunities. And um, I think what we don't know is kind of what they will be. I mean, I think there's a certain, you know, it's been interesting now, there's been, some very quick pivots um, for entrepreneurs that are doing things in, you know, personal protective equipment or making hand sanitizer or, you know, trying people trying to kind of quickly pivot their business to this reality. And, and though that's great. And, you know, I think again, the reality is it's not, it's not so easy for companies to do that. Um, but I, I, we know that there's going to be, success that comes out of it. I mean, I just look at like the education space. I mean, you know, I launched my MOOC, um, my online class in 2014 and even then everybody was saying, okay, these MOOCs are going to change higher ed and it's going to change everything. And, you know, frankly, like not a ton changed. It wasn't 
you know, many of the predictions for the disruption in educational delivery really didn't happen for a variety of reasons. Like I'm convinced that this pandemic and what's happening with sort of remote teaching and work, like, and, and healthcare delivery, you know, there's, there's no turning back. So I think for, you know, entrepreneur, you know, where people, it's just hard to get, get ahead of these things, but like, you know, clearly there's going to be new opportunities that kind of emerge out of this and, you know, trends like remote learning, healthcare delivery, all these kind of things. Um, you know, I mean, I'm imagining, I haven't been to Indonesia, I haven't looked, but I'm get, imagining like Gojek's pretty busy right now in Indonesia delivering a lot of different things. So, you know, I mean, there's certain companies that were poised well, but what's the next Gojek, you know, in Indonesia? Mm -hmm. Right, right. Um, I have another question here uh, from Tan Albert 19. Um, what is your plan after this new normal um, ends? And because it will change the market's behavior. Ooh, so Jeff, do you want to maybe answer that with uh, maybe without spilling your secrets? <laughs> What is kind of your plan so, for? So, so there's no secret actually. So uh, also um, there's no magic formula to build to build a unicorn, for example, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the the recipe to build a unicorn is a lot of uh, a lot of pain, a lot of pain uh, and the stress, and uh, it's uh, endless pain actually. So what what uh, I'm going to do? Uh, I, I think the answer to that is really wait and see. Um, that's why it's very important for us. To, to stay positive and mentally uh, healthy as well, uh, mm -hmm. not not going to uh, too much negativity, you know, uh, maybe limiting some of the, you know, reading some of the negative news because there's always there's always negative news everywhere, every day, right, every time, right. But mm -hmm. if let's say we keep positive, we uh, try to connect the dots, right? Like for example, like um, if Warren Buffett sold a lot of his airline shares, then um, Maybe uh, there's something that I need to dig more, right? For example, will people fly out right after everything is done? I don't know, right? So connecting the dots, read a lot, right? Read a lot about what happened in the uh, each of the industries and try to try to see what is the industry going to look like after the the pandemic is over. And just to also answer the previous questions, what will it takes for for this to stop is the vaccine. Uh, uh, un unless the vaccine is there, uh, I think we are still going to be haunted by this virus. And I don't know whether we will ever shake anyone's hands before the vaccines, right? Because, okay, are you are you carrier or not? Uh, so, so it's going to be weird, right? So unless a vaccine uh, is there, I think a lot of uncertainties and different people take this uh, differently. Some is very, very serious about this. Some is treating this like a joke, right? So uh, yeah. I mean, we cannot blame them, right? I'm I'm more flexible on this, right? But some people might say that, hey Jeff, you need to be more serious. And no one, no one is right or wrong. The point is, every one of us is different, and that we, that is what will make this pandemic very, very difficult to handle because not everyone will want to do one specific things to tackle this at that particular moment. So, uh, and uh, on the 4.0, we are, this pandemic is actually accelerating the industry of 4.0. So a lot of this, a lot of companies are actually uh, adopting a lot of technology. So that's, that's actually the, the, goods, the good side of this um, uh, pandemic. That's interesting what you said about how, you know, as long as there's no, you know, the, this, like the, the, the only magic solution, it seems like is like a vaccine, right? So you're saying how if there's no vaccine, like it's so hard to to say what what you know what people. Uh, I will be able to survive. So what can I do next? Uh, I I have two advice. One is strengthen the organization. In every organization, there's always this you know uh, there's always room for improvement. So. Uh, focus internally, focus to, to see and then to spend time with the team and then see, uh, see how we can actually strengthen our internal team. That's number one. And second, if you can still uh, do more things, um, then look at R&D, right? So some of the some of the strongest company in, in the world now is actually uh, 
focusing a lot on R&D and see what innovation that they can actually do in, in response to this or in a, or in anticipation of uh, the recovery going forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that, um, thanks, thanks for the really honest answer. Um, that reminds me, Michael, you, um, you know, we talk about like solutions or where is the, you know, what is going to be um, helping us through the situation and like the, 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 the not so good answer to hear is that, you know, what we don't know, like what's going to happen. Right. But Michael, um, I forgot to ask you this, uh, but you know, your whole thing is all about, you know, like beyond Silicon Valley, right? And like, we we look at what Silicon Valley is doing now in response to this and, and you know, the answer, one of the answers to this may not be found there. Like your whole thing is about how um, different companies in different countries and different parts of the world can be actually, can actually come up with the answers. Can you speak a little bit about how true you think that is now in the situation? Sure. Um, you know, I'd be curious from Jeffrey's perspective as well on this question of, of um, you know, sort of vibrant companies and talent staying in their home markets. And it's interesting because, of I mean, when Jeffrey was saying he travels once a week, you know, and now isn't traveling at all, um, you know, a lot of, at least for a U.S. context, a lot of the challenge, you know, investors tend to want to invest where they can go spend time with their companies, right? And spend time with their talents. So this idea that, um, and I'm sure, you know, in an Indonesian context, this is happening in the major metropolitan areas. I'm, I'm guessing, Jeffrey, that most of your portfolio, I'm not an expert on Indonesia. I've been once my whole life, but probably most of your companies are in the Jakarta metro or sort of larger areas. And, you know, I think there's this interesting moment and I think it's linked to remote learning. I mean, you know, San Francisco in terms of, you know, before the crisis, like the cost of housing and the cost of living there is extremely high. So, you know, I'm in a fairly low cost um, city relative to others and you know, we've always sort of wondered if you, in this world of remote learning, I mean, one of my friends um, was recently working for a company called Automatic. So Automatic um, owns, they sort of sit on top of WordPress, which is a um, content management system. And many people build websites on top of WordPress. So Automatic has no headquarters. Like it's a totally distributed workforce. So there's a difference between, um, working remotely so if you're you know you work for google and you're in cleveland but you know google's still based in san francisco like this idea that you could have a re totally remote workforce is really interesting and so i think there are these there are these um four companies looking for talent using tools like zoom and others um to do remote work and particularly like um you know, I, I think do people and maybe, you know, maybe, maybe, again, I don't know the Indonesian context very well, but like, you know, again, I was in Indonesia four years ago, but, you know, folks might want to be living in other places outside of Jakarta where it's less crowded and less polluted. And well, I guess probably the traffic's probably pretty good in Jakarta right now. Yeah. Relative, I... relative to when I was there. Oh my gosh. I've never... I've never sat in a traffic jam like I've sat in Jakarta in my whole life. I was like, this is, this is, I was like, we're, actually, I was late for my, for one of my embassy events. Like, what do you call it? Rubber time when people are late? I was yeah. sitting in that. Uh, Not I was a, like, yeah, yeah. I was like, it's like, I'm never, I mean, we were like an hour <laughs> late for the, for my presentation. They're like, oh, don't worry about it. This is what happens. Like, who wants that? You know, like, so maybe when these things come back, um, there will be, you know, people will take advantage of these. So I don't, I don't know. We're like, we're, I think there's been a number of people, even from San Francisco have said San Francisco has reached the tipping point. Like people aren't, you know, people aren't going to come back and want to pay, you know, such a high percentage of their 
salary for rent and things like that. So I mean, it'll be interesting. I mean, this might be the moment for like, Jeffrey, I'm curious for like funds like yours that are doing, that are clearly based outside of the Valley. Maybe this is your moment, you know? Yeah. Do you, do you have spots, Jeff? Uh, on, uh, can you repeat the question again? Well, the, the question was actually um, specific to Michael because he had like his whole, um, his whole thing is about, you know, beyond Silicon Valley, how companies outside that ecosystem can thrive still without like the same kind of like functions that they have in Silicon Valley. But I'm curious about like what, how, how true that is now, um, you know, because we, we hear things about how like this virus is an equalizer, right? But I think, I don't necessarily think that's true as well, because I think some, some industries or some types of companies are certainly getting more support and they can, you know, so yeah. Yeah. I don't think it's, I don't think it's like, you know, from what I've read or from what I've experienced, I don't think it's necessarily fair or useful to 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 pretend like everybody's equal in the situation. Yeah. So, um, um, so for me, uh, I mean, um, I will not compare um, countries, right? Uh, uh, but I have my own view on, for example, Silicon Valley and Indonesia. Silicon Valley is awesome place, for example, right? I mean, the amount of ecosystem there and uh, and is is not going to be easily replicated by anyone in the world in the near term, right? Maybe China is actually also very robust, uh, but they're a, close, uh, a closer economy than Silicon Valley. If you think, uh, if you look at how the Silicon Valley uh, ecosystem operates, it's amazing, right? Um, mm -hmm. So it's really, really great. US, Silicon Valley is great, uh, but other countries, uh, uh, some countries all over the world also have their own plus and minuses. Indonesia, though, um, and this is the reason why after my education in the U.S., I actually did uh, two courses in the U.S., one in UCLA and the other one in uh, uh, Harvard Business School. And uh, after both, uh, I actually decided to come back to Indonesia because I really believe that Indonesia has a very attractive risk-reward ratio. Um, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of opportunities in Indonesia. The amount of competition is not as as intense as in maybe China or Silicon Valley um, or in the US uh, and we can still build a sizable business because of our economy and population. The best thing is about Indonesia is also our, uh, our demographic dividend, right? So that's something that actually in our favor. So with or without COVID, okay, so um, does COVID have any impact globally? Yes. Uh, to me, there are certain countries that will emerge stronger than uh, the rest of the countries in the world. Uh, these are the, com the countries that actually can really react to this COVID pandemic uh, well. For example, Hong Kong is the ground zero for SARS. They're really, really used to this. I mean, they, they know they've dealt with similar kind of um, situation before, right? China, mm -hmm. they, they can manage to do lockdown and uh, they're fine. So they will be okay. So like um, Taiwan is also, I think, in good shape. Korea, I think, is also now in the better shape, right? But um, some of these companies can can recover quicker, right? And they might have a bit of uh, head start um, compared to the other countries, right? But I don't believe that it will be like an equalizer. I don't believe that uh, a country can be significantly different pre and post COVID. I don't think that will be the case. Maybe there's some exceptions here and there, but in general, there's no, I don't think there's, something like equalizer so for example indonesia is here and then become somewhere else after the COVID. i don't think so right i think long long term indonesia is still attractive because of the demographic dividends the large market and also a lot of opportunities i'm not saying that there's a lot of opportunities now because to be honest now, now is not a not, not an easy time but i believe that whoever can survive this this uh these tough times it, um, they will emerge as a stronger companies that's why my main focus for my found, founders and companies that uh, forget about growth for now. Make mm -hmm. sure that everyone is actually can survive. After mm -hmm. you can survive, then focus internally and focus on the R and D and uh, make sure that when the time comes for growth, make sure that you are in the right position to really capture 
the next wave of growth because this is actually has been a very very big setback for all of us globally i think so you're saying that there's like almost no shame if you're like taking a break um yeah i mean i mean i think everyone has been taking a break right i mean i still work uh using zoom but i mean uh, how many calls and, and 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 the current situation not many not many action going on you know uh, of course we focus a lot on on portfolio companies helping them that needs to be helped right uh but investing is is, is slowing down a lot right so uh as much as i do not want to take a break but I think we are in uh, quote unquote having a break, except if you're in um, you know in healthcare that you really need to be in the front line and then your your industry is really really positively or negatively affected. Positively affected, then you will have a lot of work, right? But if negatively affected, not much you can do, right? Yeah, yeah. I have a I have a question here. Um, Jeff was um, asking for a clarification. Uh, you had a statement earlier on about rich countries versus poor countries. Um, the the question is asking, is Indonesia considered rich or poor as Indonesia is a member of trilli- a trillion dollar economy? So I um, think it's clarifying what's rich, what's poor in the situation. So I, I do not have the definition of rich and poor, right? Uh, rich and poor just to refer to the GDP per capita. I, I, I will not say because different people have different definition. But in terms of GDP per capita, for example, to make things, uh, to put things in context, we are about four thousand to five thousand uh, dollars GDP per capita. I think India is about two, three thousand. China is maybe about nine to ten thousand. If I'm not uh, uh, mistaken, right? So um, I wouldn't say we are rich or we are poor, but I I will say that okay, look at the GDP per capita of each country, and the difference in in that GDP per capita. Can can give a sense on how long, for example, people can actually endure this this pandemic, right? Some of the rich, very very rich, uh, rich country in terms of GDP per capita, for example, in the, some of the uh, Scandinavian countries, whereby GDP per capita may be over sixty thousand dollars dollars. I think they 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 can main uh, they can actually sustain this a, a while longer because everything is quite okay, but. In the com- countries like Indonesia, I think a lot of us can really get impacted because not men- not a lot of us have a lot- enough savings compared to the other countries, things like that. Mm. Uh, Michael, do you think uh, what do you think of, um, of that in the context of the U.S.? Um, you know, like do you think with like the U.S. is like GDP and like and like can can the U.S. for example like um, see this? Um, COVID-19 play out for, you know, a longer time and, like, have the the industries be fine, do you think? Like, I think that's, like, a good question of, like, how, how long can, like, each place or maybe each industry or whatever, how long can we, like, be patient and wait it out before everything kind of, like, you know, collapses, for lack of a better word? The trillion-dollar question. Um you know, I, I, there's a lot of people that are suffering. Um, you know, people, it's interesting. I mean, obviously we, we are relative to others in the world. We, we are a rich country. We have resources, we have all this, but you know, the, the, we have a very high percentage of our population that do not have savings. Um, and I think that's true all around the world. So, when people are losing their jobs, I mean, this is this interesting question about kind of what the role the governments play. I mean, you know, the safety net, um, because unemployment spikes and all, and everywhere happens so fast, um, you know, if we can't, it, uh, who knows? I mean, I, you know, it is interesting sort of sitting here. Yes, we're you know, a richer country in terms of GDP and these things, but it is, um, I'm, I'm worried for everyone, you know, I'm worried. There's a lot to worry about. I mean, I do, because I think entrepreneurs in general are, tend to be optimistic people. Like, um, I try to be optimistic. I mean, I'm, I'm hopeful, um, that again, as we've discussed, I think some, you know, there's going to be new opportunities are going to emerge things will get better. Hopefully 
testing gets figured out and antibodies get figured out and vaccine, you know, cause we want to get back to doing things that we were doing before. And a lot of businesses that assume contacting each other, you know, I mean, it, it, I mean, and anything, you know, from, I mean, Hey, there's some advantages to being home with our families and all these things. But like if Jeffrey's in a business where he needs to be meeting with entrepreneurs and portfolio companies, in Indonesia, but he can't get there. I mean, there's just all these things that were that are slowed down that we hope will pick back up again. I mean, I mean, I hope we're getting on planes again at some point soon. But it does. It's so un, this un, this uncertainty, particularly related to the time that's involved. I've never I've never been through anything like this before. Mm. And. Um... No, that's, I completely agree. Um, I, I have another question here uh, about the U.S. So maybe, Michael, this is for you, or maybe, Jeff, you can uh, jump in as well. Um, how, are, how are in the USA small enterprises adapt with COVID-19? How, how, how do the government, private sectors, and local NGOs synergize to help small enterprises in the U.S.? So there are different programs right now, um, some formal and some informal. I mean, there's some obviously some big formal programs around payroll protection that are kind of coming from the federal level and being administered through states and local. There's some very informal kind of grassroots things about supporting businesses, um, probably like in, I'm assuming in Indonesia, restaurants are takeout only now. Um, or takeaway, we call takeout. Um, you know, I've seen a bunch of very kind of grassroots level things where people are, where, you know, you're trying to, to stay local. I mean, even like buying books, right? I mean, hey, Amazon is doing quite well in this crisis because of the ease of use, but like there's efforts. It's like, hey, buy your book online from a local bookseller, not Amazon, um, you know, because there is this concern that you sort of emerge from the crisis and local retail can't survive, you know, and you're just, I mean, I don't think anybody just wants Amazon. I mean, I, I don't know. And I don't know the, 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 um, the, who the players are in Indonesia, but, you know, there is this fear that small business these kids going to get, you know, it may not come back, some of them. So there are some of these efforts about sort of buying local. I mean, the arts, like my kids are musicians. Um, my daughter plays a cello and the other plays a violin. You know, like the orchestras are closed, you know, so there's a lot of different things that you're seeing online to sort of support musicians. Um, these kids, they're, they're in an orchestra that's not playing. So... I think there's a lot of really cool goodwill that's happening, but it may not be enough. Mm. Mm, that's interesting. How like, yeah, I think I, I also see that like community rallying um, businesses, you know, to support businesses. But that's interesting that you said like, you know, it, it may not be enough uh, in, in, you know, in the era of COVID-19. And um while we're on the topic of like giving the support, um, Jeff, there's a question for you uh, around support. Um, does Alpha JWC Ventures also provide assistance for startups to be able to survive in this pandemic? So in general, we actually quite a hands-on uh, investor. So um, even before the COVID, we, we uh, provide quite a lot of help to our portfolio companies like in hiring, in, you know, in fundraising, strategy, um, PR and communication. Uh, for uh, during this pandemic, even um, before things are getting slowed down, like before Pace Baby, for example, when, uh, when we know that this, this uh, whole thing could be quite uh, worrying, we actually have uh, proactively reached out to all of our founders. Uh, we have quite a big team. We have about more than 10 investment uh, professionals in, in our firm. So, and we have about maybe 40 companies in our uh, portfolio. So we actually proactively reach out to most of them uh, and then see how we can help them and then um, 
try to align and share what we know. I think what's important is is uh, sharing perspective, right? Sharing perspective, sharing what we see out there. For example, I think if we if we learn or at least if we know how China actually reacted from this virus, because they they are I think about three months ahead of us, we can get a sense, right? For example, after uh, everything is uh, after the lockdown is done, are people coming back to malls? Are people coming back to restaurants, right? Yes, people are coming back, but not at the level that, you know, previously, right? I think there's a good article in The economy saying that maybe it's only 60% of um, people are actually going back to restaurants, things like that. So if we learn from what happened in China and also in the region, and if we share this to our founders, I think that is something that could be uh, valuable, right? And also sharing about uh, how's the situation on the ground. For example, if uh, I think one of uh, interesting and good a matrix that I always want to know is that do we have enough uh, hospital beds available now if let's say anyone got infected by COVID and really need a serious attention and I think based on the latest data that I have at least we have a couple of uh, portfolio companies that have uh, some visibility to hospitals mm-hmm. we're actually okay right for patients who really needs uh, um, uh, emergency or intensive care I think that's uh, it's get, um, the capacity of hospital are, is getting better, so we can expect that um, the um, the peak is maybe soon, uh, right? Because everything is quite under control in Indonesia, at least. So uh, sharing that perspective, I think, is very very valuable because because then the companies will be able to know what maybe what to expect and have a bit of information and also a judgment on how to proceed going forward. Hmm. No, that's interesting. I think. Um... I think you, you know, you, we, we've been talking about a lot of what we can do to like, you know, to, I think, survive individually and also with our teams. I'm curious what you, and we, at the same time, we've also been talking about how, you know, nobody really knows when this is all going to happen or when it's going to get better. It's really up to each country, each government or each state to, you know, help figure this out with us. Um, I'm curious what, how, um, on, you know, about your, your, both of your perspectives on um, dealing with this like burnout feeling of like waiting for something that's like, it's kind of like running a marathon without like knowing where the finish line is. Like, how is that, how, 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 how has that affected your, your work, your, your business, your, um, your teams? I think that's also something that I like have been thinking about like with my own team at campaign. And I know that like, um, you know, at, you know, with like the, the, the folks at America, we've talked about like, you know, like oh, when are, when are these calls going to end? It's like, when, can, you know what I mean? And that like really weighs down on like people and like, and that affects how people, uh, you know, interact in like companies. Like what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so maybe I can share what we did, right? So first of all, I really believe that um, personally, I think um, we can we can make this situation to be a positive one or negative one, right? If we are too stressful about it and we do not do positive things, then things will be negative. But if we stay positive, then actually a lot of things that we can actually do in this current situation to, to capitalize on that. One, uh, at, at the very least, uh, at least what I personally did in my company is that I spend more time in the, with with, with uh, the team, um, so having one on ones, right? So so this is actually a good thing that uh, uh, we as a leader uh, we can spend a bit more time with the team, understanding them, and then really uh, showing that okay, um, care, we care about the team. And also, uh, I think it's also important to to stay positive and also. Um, get into more personal, I think, in this current situation, right? To make sure that we understand how everyone is doing because um, it's not easy to add to, to to be able to know whether someone is stressful or not, how everyone is coping, right? So for example, in our weekly meeting, we, we usually, we start with personal, right? Okay, share a half a minute or one minute, how are you doing um, personally? Then people share and then at least that makes a lot of things better. We do not know when this will end, but I really believe that we can survive this as long as we are positive, right? If we are positive, uh, we we do the right thing, uh, we keep uh, keep a close eye on what's happening, try to connect the dots, and um, just make sure that we survive this. I think whoever can survive this will come out stronger. That is my belief. 
uh, what about you, Michael? What do you think? Like how to, you know, you work with, you know, you work in this like university system as well. And like you, you know, you mentioned your students and everything. What are your thoughts on like this, this really long waiting game? Yeah, no, it's, um, it's very uh, wearing, like mentally, physically. I mean, one thing that we're trying to do, um, I mean, even because uh, I think what is happening, and it sounds like this is happening to all of us, is that we can sit at our, you get chained to your desk doing these Zoom calls or, you know, whatever platform you're using. And, um, you know, at least in Cleveland, the weather is getting better now. Um, so I'm doing a lot more. I'm really like intentionally like doing calls. I'm, I'm telling people not to use, I'm saying, okay, let's, we, they try to schedule a zoom call and I'm like, let's do a phone call. Um, not video and just kind of release yourself from, um, the video piece. I mean, I think obviously for things like this, they're really good, but I think we have to, um, to get out um and and not you know be active um I, i mean obviously there's a lot of people that are you know and this this is less about kind of business and more about just sort of like physical or mental health i think people are doing workouts at home i mean there's all sorts of things that people are doing you're doing um you know having drinks via video i mean these are all nice things but i do think like we have to be very mindful about just kind of releasing ourselves from our desks in a different way. I mean, I, I, I didn't even really appreciate, um, I think for all of us, you know, who are, are, we're working in more traditional settings. It's like that walking, popping into someone's cube or office, or for me, like walking on campus and running into someone, you know, those are really important. Those can be important, like networking or work moments um, in a different way. Because not everything, you know, Jeffrey could probably attest to this, like even in the, okay, there may be the moment that the venture capitalist is like scheduling a due diligence call with a potential investment and there's that, but then there's like that, you know, as you mentioned, Jeff, like the talking about what, what else is going on. I mean, it's part, half of business is not negotiating the terms on a term sheet, but it's like, oh, we're, we're both fans of LeBron James, or I used to be, not anymore. Um, you know, you try to find these other things that you can connect with, like that's, that's business as well. So, um, and, and this, this remote just, there's, we have to get back to kind of thinking about other ways to do that because this, this is just sitting here all day is uncomfy. Right, right. And I think, I think that's a, that's a really good point. It's like, sorry, it's like, um, you know, trying to, trying to survive while waiting and hoping that, you know, things don't, things don't arrive at like a, like a, like a even worse scenario. Right. Um, and it's, I think it's like, there's an art to that, but um, Jeff, there's like a, there's a, there's another question on also like a follow-up to, to your answer on worse scenarios. <laughs> um The question goes, in the worst scenario, as a, a case, low recovery with uncertainty, what will VCs do? I mean, the behavior of VCs in terms of funding new startups under economic slowdown. So I, I think this um, this question can can easily apply to both of you, I think. Like what, like in terms of like what what will yep. what can we do during you know worst scenarios? Okay, so uh, institutional VC firm like us will uh, will continue to invest because in every situation, there's always opportunity, right? But uh, the reality is that in the current situation, I think the amount of opportunity will be less than in the, in the bull market, for example. So we will still uh, invest. In fact, we still have a couple of live deals. We just give them shit, you know, a few weeks ago. And I know we, we are still evaluating companies. So no change from our side, but uh, of course the um, the quantity uh, like, like um, uh, the number of deals might be less in the current situation. Uh, especially a lot of uh, a lot of founders and companies also not focusing on fundraising right now. They're really focusing on how they can uh, actually um, uh, coping with the current situation, right? But uh, 
Uh, I will say that if you find opportunity in the market, you should keep doing that because um, there are always money in in the market in uh, no matter how bad the situation is. For example, we are still investing and I also believe that there are a couple other uh, VCs that are also still uh, investing in the situation, right? So if you have good ideas, go for it. Right. Uh, Michael, do you have um, thoughts on that? I mean, I think some of just a broader comment, maybe on networking. Um, I mean, LinkedIn, I think, remains a really practically valuable tool for um, students, for entrepreneurs. Um, you know, take advantage, like even after a session like this, like connect with me on LinkedIn, try to connect with Jeffrey. I mean, every, everybody has different philosophies of things. So LinkedIn from people they don't know, but like, I think use these moments to build your networks. Um, I think the other thing that I always tell my students is like, you know, try to, um, you know, is there an art, like maybe you read something that you thought I would be interested in or Jeffrey would be interested in or Leah would be interested, you know, like send an article, like try to, um, you know, if you have kind of a give first perspective, because you may, as an entrepreneur, need funding, you may need, there's a lot of things you need, but um, I think we should all sort of take the approach. I mean, particularly during this time, it's like, what, what else can you give to people? And, um, and that doesn't need to be money or, you know, and again, I think things like supporting entrepreneurs in your own community by purchasing their product or services. So I think this is a, this is a time where we need to come together as whether it's sort of local, regional, national, or even global. I mean, you know, the fact that we're all sort of sitting on a call and I'm in Cleveland and Jeffrey's in Singapore and you guys are in Jakarta. Man. It is kind of amazing. Like, we don't even think about it. It's just everything works and, you know, we're, we take it for granted, but it is pretty, like, the fact even five years ago, certainly 10 years ago, that the seamlessness of doing these things, it's so easy and, and networks are global too. Yeah, well, thank you so much for both of your answers in the last an hour and a half. Uh, Michael and Jeffrey from Ohio and Singapore, thank you so much. I think if I can briefly summarize everything, it's basically, you know, um, try your best, um, plan for when things pick up, uh, you know, improve, get new skills if you can, and, you know, other lessons that you've both have like very articulate, uh, articulately like explained to us. Um, I'm really thankful to, to have had discussed this with you all. Uh, and also thank you for um, USMBC and campaign.com for making this happen. Uh, I think that concludes um, our discussion tonight uh, and I'll hand it over to Ad America team. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you, Malia, and thank you to all of our speakers for sharing the great session tonight, uh, and of course, to answering all of the questions. So earlier in the event, we asked you guys, uh, due to COVID-19, small business owners in the U.S. are eligible to apply for an economic disaster injury loan that worth up to how much? And the correct answer is D, $10,000. And congratulations to... Hendrik Patron Pangarso and Arif Bawono Surya for answering correctly. And thank you to everyone who has participated. Don't forget to tune in next time and get a chance to get shot out uh, from us. Now, you may be wondering how can you develop an awesome idea for a place like this? Don't worry, you can send your event proposal to us by visiting our website at www.adamerica.or.id. So like create a program and go to collaborate with us. All proposals coming to us will be reviewed and your event might be featured here soon. You can also subscribe to our newsletter for all of our weekly events, update that will be sent straight to your inbox. That wraps this episode. It has been fun, folks, but unfortunately, we have to say goodbye for now. Don't forget to follow us at our Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Ad America for all of our event updates, fun content, and so much more. Also, don't, work, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for joining, and see you next time at Ad America TV. Bye-bye.